University of Ottawa. The Committee of Adjustment is a quasi-judicial tribunal appointed by City Council to make decisions on certain types of development applications under the Planning Act, and I think uh, most folks are familiar with uh, consent applications and minor variances. My name is Anne Tavli, and I will be chairing this hearing today. And with me today, I have uh, fellow panel members, uh, Mr. Scott Hindle, I believe, uh, who's joining us, um, Ms. Julia Markovich, Mr. Colin White, I believe, who will also be joining us shortly, and Ms. Kathleen Willis. Oh, everyone's here. We're all aboard. Great. Thanks so much. Also uh, joining us tonight, I'd like to introduce our um, Deputy Secretary Treasurer, Ms. Um, Warna Brenning, and I'd also like to introduce um, Ms. Christine Papworth, who will be our coordinator uh, for the evening. Great, and I see that we also have Mr. Jamie Batchelor from the RVCA with us this evening. So hello, welcome. So. Uh, please take note that this is a video conference. I think you already know that. It is being live streamed on uh, YouTube and the video along with the agenda is uh, going to be available um, going forward on the, well, and I guess uh, earlier today on the city's website. So, and before I begin, I've got a couple of announcements or instructions that we have to provide. And the first is to remind you that while there are the issues surrounding development within the city, are broad, the committee's mandate is in fact quite narrow. Um, the committee cannot consider, for example, aspects of the proposal that are not related to the required variances. So we uh, are here to discuss the variances that are before us in the application and uh, not to talk about sort of peripheral matters um, that may be related to the development. We also can't talk about any noise concerns, property maintenance, property values, uh, anything regarding prosecution for illegal construction, personal comments about uh, neighbors, agents, or applicants, we certainly will not be entertaining those. And finally, uh, any additional variances. So sometimes it happens that we have additional variances that, that come up during discussion that we realize that we either need to add, or sometimes it's that the relief is greater than what was originally asked for in the application. In all those cases, we need to adjourn the meeting and to allow for recirculation of the application. So as part of the statutory uh, public notification requirements, each applicant is required to post a sign on the property and then file a statutory declaration confirming that sign posting. That declaration or an oath has to be on file or has to be recorded um, with the application before we can hear it. So the coordinator uh, at this point has confirmed with us that we have in fact no hard copies of any statutory or you know, electronic copies of statutory declaration. So we will be doing uh, the swearing of the oaths uh, this evening. Um, also with respect to quorum, we're, because we're, uh, we're doing this through technology, at times we experience some difficulties. So in the case that uh, we lose quorum, then we will try and just pause the, uh, the hearing to allow the member or members to rejoin the, um, the meeting. If we can't reestablish quorum, then we will step down the remainder of the items that are left on the agenda and we will put them on to the very next meeting and, uh, and deal with them uh, in due course in that way. So you'll notice that um, we have an agenda. Uh, we don't have it up on the screen right now, but uh, we have a number of items. We have 11 items this evening on that agenda. We uh, can and will be making uh, some uh, changes to the order in which uh, the applications will be heard tonight. Also know that the members have reviewed all of the application materials prior to, uh, to any decision. And we've looked at all of the written correspondence that's been on file. And when I say that, I will qualify that by saying that anything that we may have received by the end of day Monday, we can guarantee we've seen. But sometimes when we get last minute submissions, uh, it's just given that a number of us work, it's impossible to, in fact, get to a uh, late submission. So I just wanted to put that caveat out there. Also, um, when we get into the, to the actual order of the hearings, we, we're going to ask and we're going to start with a brief presentation. At times, we may waive that requirement um, at the outset of, the, of uh, the hearing on an application. 
once uh, once that presentation is done, or if we decide to waive it, we we can follow up with applications. I mean, the the, the panel can uh, follow up with um, questions. Sorry, to the applicant to get any clarification. Once that's done, and we can also ask staff for clarification. Once all once all of that's done, then we uh, will open up the uh, hearing on that application to the public portion, which means at that point. Uh, there is an opportunity for anyone who has an interest in the application to address the panel. And so we'll ask you to make a submission. And then if we have any uh, additional questions for clarification based on some of the information that you provided to us, then we can ask you those questions at that uh, point in time as well. If you have, if you're on the speakers list, that's great. Typically in those cases, we have your name already and your uh, municipal address. If you haven't filled out um, a speaker's form, then uh, we may ask you to uh, start with your municipal address and also with uh, perhaps even the spelling of your name. Uh, so uh, just a reminder that we keep the uh, presentations uh, during the public hearing to five minutes. Uh, and then after all the parties had a chance to address the panel, we close that, um, that uh, hearing portion, the public hearing portion down, and then the committee may ask a few additional questions for clarification, and then we go to a decision. So based on the decision, we can make an oral decision this evening to either grant or deny the application. The committee may also, by exception, choose to uh, reserve its decision, and we have done that already a few times while being on, in online format. Um, and that's really just to take into consideration additional evidence that we've heard during the course of the evening that may not have been part of either the, um, uh, the reports from staff or from sure. anyone else uh, up until that point. So uh, once the decisions are made, committee does issue, or committee staff does issue within 10 days of the hearing, a formal written decision outlining the panel's reasoning on the matter. And all those decisions of the committee are subject to a 20 day appeal period during which time the decision can be appealed to the local appeal, local, local sorry, planning appeal tribunal for a fee. So we can start now with uh, a few items of business. Does anyone have any declarations of interest to declare on either our panel tonight or any previous this evening? Okay, great. So seeing no declarations of conflict of interest, um, Ms. Papworth, can I just confirm with you that we have no minutes to uh, to adopt this evening? Madam Chair, we have no minutes to adopt this evening. Thank you very much. All right, so we're going to go to adjournment requests, and we do have uh, one, possibly two. So the first one is uh, on item number five, which is for 350 Montgomery. Looking for Ms. Uh, Ms. Rosalind Hill. Is she with us this evening? take a couple of minutes. Hello. Hello. Good evening. How are you? Good. Thanks. Excellent. So we've had a chance to look at both. <clears throat> I guess there's a recommendation from both staff and by yourself to uh, to adjourn this item. Is that correct? <clears throat> That's right. Um, we um, have a, a difference of understanding about how we calculate amenity area. Um, and it, our understanding is that the way that it's calculated has changed at the city or the city's interpretation has changed over time since our our last permit application with them and so we actually just need some time to sort that out um, it's likely that our requested variance will have to change slightly um, to reflect this uh, alternate way of calculating so we're likely to have to increase this the size of our the numerical size of our variance even though we're not sharing, changing the substance of our application at all. All right, so, but you will be seeking uh, greater relief from the bylaw than what's in the application right now, which means a recirculation, as you know. Yeah, that's right. So I guess, I, I, I guess I'm looking at dates now. So uh, Secretary Treasurer, does um, September 2nd, it seems tight. I'm looking at September 16th. Would that be a better date to adjourn this item to? Ms. Brenning? How about Ms. Papworth? There, okay. 
back oh. on? Okay, <laughs> I'm unmuted. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, it would depend. We could do the 16th, uh, depending on when uh, the agent can uh, get the revised figures to us. All right, so how does oh. the 16th sound? Um, so if we get the numbers to you within a week, are we okay for the 16th? We should be, yes, correct. Yeah. All right, so, um, okay, so before we get into, uh, well, first off, does any of the committee members have questions for Ms. Hill about this request for adjournment? No? Okay, so I'm going to ask the public, is there anyone out in the public who wants to speak either for or against this request for adjournment? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. So, Ms. Hill, I think the committee is granting the adjournment to September 16th at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. All right, so the next one that we are considering for adjournment is actually applications three and four for um, 1821 Prince of Wales. And I guess what we, I guess before we decide whether or not we are going to be adjourning this item, we, we need, a, need to address, I think it's Ms. Ramirez on that. Ms. Ramirez. Can we speak with you, please? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. <laughs> yes. Good evening, Ms. Ramirez. Good, good so evening. I guess there's a couple of things going on with this application uh, with regards to right of way. And um, so I think we're just, before we decide whether or not we want to proceed with this application, I guess we're, we're, we're just, we want to make sure that we have the information that we need to move forward. And I think I'm going to, if Mr. White, if I can call upon you to maybe just uh, explain the uh, the issue and answer or ask the question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, just to, I'm looking at the uh, plan that was submitted uh, with the application showing the right of way. And there's an existing wood fence. Uh, which runs along the paved surface of the roadway and it's clearly the wood fence is clearly inside the public right of way for Prince of Wales Drive. Um, there's also uh, and looking at the site aerial photo aerial photos and on the ground there's also apparently it, it appears that there are um, structures that are located on the site of 1821 Prince of Wales Drive. They, these are they look like uh, accessory structures or built into a, uh, they seem to link, one of them seems to link to the fence that extends to the actual building itself on the ground. But it it's, appears to me that those structures are located within the right of way, in other words, off the property. And also with respect to uh, the new development, uh, the new, the, 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 the lot that would, would see the new development occur, um, a substantial amount of the driveway again is located within the existing road allowance, but providing only a three meter, um, a three meter setback from the garage to the actual property line. Um, and also in our comments that were received from our transportation people, um, maybe I can locate those, uh, they indicated that they want us to ensure that the right of way is protected. Now, when I hear something like that, uh, it's not specific in the comment. When I hear something like that, it, it leads me to believe that there, there possibly is a requirement for additional road widening. They also speak, I think, in their comments uh, about protecting for a bicycle lane and uh, and and. If it is to be if, if Prince Wales is to be reconstructed, I'm assuming that being that it's an arterial road, that normal standard is that you have a bicycle lane and you also install a sidewalk. In this case, if a sidewalk and a bicycle lane is installed, I'm I'm somewhat fearful that there might be some interference with uh, any any parking or access to that driveway. Um, there may be some interference with a with a with a sidewalk and or a bicycle lane uh, because of the 
the very limited setback to the garage, the front front of the garage. Um, I just I, I'm just of the view that we need a little bit more information from our transportation people that, with respect to what's going to happen on that on that right of way. Uh, clearly, sure. I don't believe that that existing wood fence is going to be permitted to be maintained if there's a reconstruction that happens there. So, Ms. Ramirez, I guess what we're asking is whether or not you have answers to all of that, because in the absence of having answers to all of that, then we're not in a position, I don't think, to have the information we need to make knowledgeable decisions. So are you, do you have that information for us if we proceed? Um, so I have, through you, Madam Chair, I have some of that information. Uh, there is no right of way protection that's required at this location. Um, so it doesn't, we're protecting the right of way. It doesn't refer to asking for um, additional right of way. Um, I did review the Prince of Wales reconstruction um, design for North of Fisher and those reconstruction uh, drawings show that the existing, that the reconstructed road will tie into existing conditions around 1885 Prince of Wales. And so it wouldn't have any impact on 1821 Prince of Wales and 1833 Prince of Wales. Um, so that's within the proposed works that's going to be happening there. Um, with respect to the encroachment, uh, there it, the wooden fence is encroaching on our right of way. Um, per our encroachment bylaw, we wouldn't, um, they'd have to go through a process if they wanted any new encroachments. Um, there is a provision in the bylaw that encroachments that existed before the year 2003 um, could be approved, um, but we're not in the habit of going back and retroactively approving um, a lot of these encroachments. All right, so based on that, Mr. White, um, I guess I'm looking for the committee. Are we proceeding then with hearing this application? No, gentlemen, I'm not gonna ask you to speak. This is really just between the committee members right now. So yes, Ms. Willis. Um, I'm not sure, um, Ms. Ramirez, whether I, I quite understood. You're saying that with this particular reconstruct functional design that the project basically ends further to the south than, than the subject property. Is that, so they haven't yet done a design as it fronts on this property? Uh, that is correct. There was a um, environmental assessment study that was done for a portion of Prince of Wales and that um, basically goes from Fisher I'm trying to remember the other limit, but it was done back in 2011 and the design um, that we have right now, um, it uh, ties into Prince of Wales um, just after 1885 Prince of Wales. Okay, so there is no, and we, we, you've confirmed that the right of way has been protected, so there's no further property that's required. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna hear the application members? I think we can. Yeah, all right, I think so too. All right, so on that basis, we will move forward with, uh, with this application. We're stepping it down for now. We're gonna move forward with, uh, with other ap applications in the interim. And I would like to start with, um, go with number one and two, which is uh, for 837 Rydell. Do we have a Mr. Lutich? Mr. Lutage, can we see you please? Can we hear you? You're on mute. Perfect. Hello. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. So we're not going to ask for a presentation from you, but before right. all of that, you need to, you have the declare, I'm talking about the signed declaration. So I need uh, either an oath or a solemn declaration from you. So I'm gonna read something and then I'm gonna ask you to either uh, swear or affirm. So do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process by the committee was first posted on the property to which the application applies? Secondly, that it was in fact posted for the prescribed number of days 
before the hearing and that thirdly, it was clearly visible and legible during the entirety of that time. Do you uh, either swear or affirm that to be true? I swear that to be true. All right, thank you. All right, so we've taken care of that portion. Um, so the other portion that I would like to take care of with this application is we have two housekeeping amendments that we have to make to the lot areas for both um, the uh, application B00079 and um, 00399. So in a, in a, instead of 374.8 square meters, for the first property um, at B0079, we're now uh, looking at 375.1 square meters. And for the second property, instead of the 374.8, we're looking at 374.9 square meters. Do you agree with that change? Yes, I do. All right, perfect. Okay, so based on that, uh, we can go directly to questions by the uh, committee members. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Lutich on this application? Nothing? All right. Okay, so this is uh, both uh, a consent and uh, relatively minor, minor variances for both uh, properties on a lot width. So um, since we don't have any questions at this point, I'm going to open it up to the public. I don't have any registered speakers for this application, but uh, I'm gonna give a chance to anyone out there right now to either speak for or against either the consent application or the minor variance application. I'm not seeing any hands. I'm not seeing anything. So, all right, so we'll, we'll Consider that closed. Um, so committee, um, I'm looking for whether or not we're granting this, these applications, both applications, the consent and minor variance. Are you in favor? Everyone? Okay, Madam so. Chair, uh, just the comment from Hydro with respect to the uh, second story balconies and the servicing, is that, a, is that an issue for the- uh, Good point, thank you. So just to be sure, Mr. Lutens, you've you've read all of the comments that have come in and the the yeah, uh, yes, I have. Right? Yes, yeah, yeah. And that, that, right. that definitely will be addressed. The the electrical overhead uh, wiring will be altered a little bit, but that'll be dealt with hydro directly and the electricians involved. All right. So any other anything else, Mr. Lutens, you'd like to add before we conclude? I don't think so. All right. Well then the, your application is granted and it's unanimous, all members of the committee in agreement. So thank you very much. Thank you. Join us. Okay. Good night. Okay, the next uh, application is uh, number eight and nine for uh, eight fourteen Kingsmere. So I'm looking for Mr. Segreto. Hello. Hello, Mr. Segreto. How are you this evening? Good evening. Very good. Thank you. Great. Okay, so again with you, uh, need to do the, um, the uh, declaration or oath. So do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was first posted at the property to which the application applies, secondly, for the prescribed number of days before the hearing, and thirdly, that the sign was clearly visible and legible for the entirety of that time. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that to be true? I swear to be posted. All right, perfect. Okay, so we're not, again on this, it's a, both a consent application and a minor variance. And again, we're looking at minor variance application that is uh, just for lot widths and lot areas for four parcels. We're not going to ask you for a presentation. We've had a chance to look at this already in detail. I'm gonna open the floor to the members of the committee at this point. Anyone uh, have any questions for Mr. Segreto on any of, uh, of this application? Yes, Mr. Hendel. Yeah, I just wanna ask, uh, I note that there had been some back and forth about a retaining wall and fence in the rear. Can you just describe the, uh, the solution you've come to there? What we've done is uh, the owner has met with the abutting neighbors at the back. They had some issues with respect to the retaining wall. They were concerned about the uh, lot grading and drainage. 
The owner has agreed with the uh, civil engineer that they are going to be putting the retaining wall to self-contain all the water on their property. In addition to that, the owner has also agreed to put up a fence. Uh, so there would be some privacy between the rear yards and the abutting neighbors to the back of us. So that was all talked out and it was all agreed. This is my understanding. Okay, so yeah. this outcome shouldn't make, shouldn't make your building code um... And not at all. Not at all. I think everything will be fine. Problem. Uh, once we once we apply for our building permit, we'll be showing the fence and the retaining wall as well. Okay. Other questions? Yep. All right. On this again, I don't have any registered speakers. Uh, so I am going to open it up to the public to anyone who at this point would like to speak either for or against the consent or the minor variance applications. Okay, again, I'm not seeing any hands go up. I'm not seeing uh, anyone asking to speak. So we can close that portion. So Mr. Uh, Segreto, you've had a chance to look at all of the comments and the um, conditions on this, uh, this, this application. Yes, I have, I'm fine with them. So, any concerns, anything at all? Any final words? <laughs> no, I'm good, <laughs> I'm good. All right, so committee members, um, uh, all those in favor, please. All right, so I see that we are all, again, it's unanimous. We're all in favor of the application. So you're, both applications are granted. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, the next application that we'd like to hear is uh, number 10. That's her 1285 Lotus. Do we have the owners? I have no agent for this. I have the owners. So I'm looking for Anish uh, Krishna or Sisra Suresh. Hello. Hi, Hi. how are you? <laughs> Very well, thank you. How are you this evening? Thank you. Good. All right. So we're not going to ask you for a presentation uh, on this application tonight. We have had a chance to look at it. It is fairly, uh, again, straightforward. So um, any members of the committee have questions? Pardon for me, Madam Chair. We will require the statutory declaration oath for this application. Thank you, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Papworth. Okay. All right. So uh, this, and you do understand this is for the sign posting. Okay, so do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process by the committee was first posted at the property to which the application applies? Secondly, that it was, um, it was posted for the prescribed number of days before the hearing? And thirdly, that the sign was clearly visible and legible during the entirety of that time. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that to be true? Yeah, solemnly swear. All right, thank you. Okay, so we've done that. All right, back to questions then by the committee uh, for our owners of this property. Anybody have any questions for clarification? No? Maybe again, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so I, again, I don't have any members of the public registered to speak to this, but I am gonna open the public hearing portion and allow anyone who would like to speak either for or against this minor variance application to, uh, to raise their hand now. Okay, and I'm not seeing anybody. So on that basis then, um, committee, are you um, in favor of the application? Everyone, that's good? Okay, all right. So with that then, your application, that was, that was short and sweet, wasn't it? <laughs> Thank you. So your application's granted. So good luck with, uh, with your project and Thank you. um, thanks for, for coming to see us thanks. this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Good night. Okay. We are going to go to, I'd like to go to number 11 at this point, which is for 2441 Clairou. So I have uh, Miss for an agent, Karina Guzman. Hello, Hello. how are you? Good, how are you? Very good, thank you. Okay, so before I forget, can we do the statutory declaration? 
Um, so do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted first on the property to which the application um, applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing and that it was clearly vi vi visible and legible at all times? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that to be true? I affirm this to be true, yes. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so I think on this one, we're going to ask you, Ms. Guzman, for a brief presentation sure. of, uh, of, the, uh, of the application. All right. I believe you should have it, uh, Ms. Papworth. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so um, thank you so much for having me this evening. Uh, my name is Karina Guzman and I am the owner at uh, 2441 Cleru, and I'll be presenting to you today with regards to our applications uh, for the minor variances. Uh, next, please. Uh, so first, I'd like to give you a little bit of context into um, this, the neighborhood. Uh, so 2441 Cleru is located in uh, Blackburn, Blackburn Hamlet. Um, it is a crescent. Oh, sorry. Uh, could you uh, go to the next slide, please? Or the next point? Thank you. Um, and uh, it is a crescent. So on one half of the crescent, it's an R2 zoning and there's basically uh, you know, single homes, uh, detached homes on that whole side. On the other half of the crescent um, is where we are located. And it's a, it's a very mixed use area. Uh, so to the east, there's uh, townhome complexes like the one on the top uh, right hand corner. And we also have a mix of um, detached um, and low rise apartment buildings like the one in the bottom left hand corner. Uh, to the west side, uh, we have uh, a senior's residence. So in the bottom picture there to the right, bottom right, um, you'll see it's like a blue looking building on the left hand, that is the senior's residence. And right across from that is the school with a park. And then there's some more town and townhomes and uh, duplex. So it's a very, um, it's a very mixed, uh, residential use street um, with an R4 zoning to this side. Our proposal is to, can you click one more please? Uh, is to demolish the existing bungalow. So this is currently what is there. Uh, one more click please. And then we're going uh, to construct a, a three story, six unit apartment building. So this is what we have uh, submitted to the city uh, as of today. Next, please. Um, this is our site plan. Uh, so this is to give you a bit of idea how we propose to use the lot itself. Uh, we have designed it so that we have a driveway that will allow for the cars to go uh, to the rear um, parking. Uh, we are providing seven uh, parking spots in total with a bit of uh, landscaping in the back. There is uh, a walkway that will allow residents to walk from the back to the uh, existing side uh, entry and of course to the front as well. At the front, um, we are providing a ramp that will provide a barrier free entrance for wheelchair accessibility on the ground floor, as well as um, a biking uh, spots for the residents to use. Um, there also exists a, a, a Manitoba maple right on the, on the lot. So that tree that you see there in the corner um, that currently exists today and we intend to uh, keep it. Um, throughout the entire design, we made sure to not be close to that uh, tree and not to disturb it. So it's always been the intent to keep that tree in place. I did receive the uh, comment from Forestry um, regarding this tree. And uh, I do confirm that we intend to hire an arborist to let us know exactly how to provide the um, uh, the barrier uh, required during the construction. So that is not a problem for us uh, whatsoever. Next, please. And these are the variances that uh, we are requesting. Um, so the, for the front and, and rear uh, setbacks, we meet those. Uh, the side yard setbacks, we are required to provide five meters uh, for each side. Um, so our variance, uh, the first variance is to request a reduced easterly uh, interior side yard setback of four meters. 
Um, and then on the west side, we are requesting um, a reduced westerly interior side yard setback of three um, uh, in total. Uh, for the landscape area, uh, the requirement is 30% total landscape area. Um, because we had to provide for the uh, ramp to allow for the wheelchair accessibility and because it's considered concrete, it's not part of the landscape area. Um, and so because of the ramp, uh, we're not meeting that 30% uh, requirement. So we are requesting a reduced total landscape of 28.3% um, for the, the landscape area. And then for the, uh, the parking requirement, we are required to have eight spots. Um, we are proposing to have seven. So we are requesting a decreased parking space rate um, of one um, spot per unit, whereas the bylaw requires us to have a 1.2 per, uh, per dwelling unit. So in, in all those are four uh, minor variances that we are requesting for our proposed uh, redevelopment of this lot. Next, please. Uh, in terms of the four tests, um, the first question was, is the variance minor? Uh, we believe the deviations are minor in nature as we are keeping uh, within the, the, the visibility of the streetscape. Um, it is lined like with various different uses as mentioned before. And with those uses come a lot of varying setbacks already, uh, whether that would be side yard setbacks, rear yard setbacks or front yard setbacks. Uh, existingly, it's just a, a wide variety of setbacks um, in play at, at, on the street. In some cases, there's actually no setbacks at all. Um, and although we are requesting a, re re a reduction of the side yard setbacks, we're actually increasing what's, what's currently there right now. Um, so we don't expect it to be much of um, an impact to the neighbors uh, because in essence, we're actually increasing um, the space between us and the, uh, the neighbors uh, to the left and to the right of us. Uh, next, please. Uh, is the variance desirable for the appropriate development or land use? Uh, redeveloping it from a single dwelling to a multi-unit apartment building um, does support the official plan policy um, by providing the low density infill uh, development in areas that are zoned like this for intensification. Uh, so we do uh, believe that our three-story building is very compatible uh, with the existing characteristics of the, of the street. Next, please. Does the variance maintain the general intent and purpose of the official plan? Um, we do believe it conforms to the official plan. The variances that we request uh, are also very supportive of the city's growth strategy uh, in terms of the low scale soft intensification and of course, helping meet uh, the city's residential uh, housing targets. And lastly, uh, does the variance uh, maintain the general intent and purpose of the zoning bylaw? Uh, yes, uh, the intended use does um, comply with the general intent of the zoning bylaw, although we are requesting some minor variances in terms of the side yard setbacks and the parking and the total landscape. It does not affect um, the other requirements that are being requested by the uh, zoning bylaw. So we are meeting uh, the rest of the requirements in terms of our, our proposal. And I believe uh, that should be it for, for now. And uh, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm open to uh, discussing any uh, questions you may have. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Guzman. That was a very good presentation. Gives us a good uh, overview of what it is that you're trying to do. So uh, at this point, I'm going to open up the um, the meeting to the members to ask any questions for clarification. Yes, Ms. Willis. Um, yes, Ms. Guzman, just um, a, um, a question on if, if we could look at the site plan again, sure. that could be put up on the um, screen. So I, in reading your report, I believe you explained the the seven the variance for the seven spaces as a means to um, avoid going through the site plan control process. 
but that you could, you were in a position where you could actually accommodate eight spaces on the site. And looking at this site plan, I'm just wondering if that was the case, where that eighth parking space would go. So um, initially we had designed it with the eight parking spots. Um, it, it, it was a very different site plan than what it looks like uh, right now. So the building was actually a bit wider and shorter uh, than it is uh, right now. So, um, uh, so we have changed it quite significant because of that uh, change. Um, so it, it doesn't show that uh, clearly here, but in, in the sense of allowing the eighth uh, parking spot, we would have been able to do that by decreasing the actual uh, length of the building, and but widening it, widening uh, the existing building. So uh, we just reworked uh, the, entire, um, the entire use of the lot to, uh, to make this happen. So this, this layout will not accommodate an eighth space, is that, is that correct? No. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions from the members? Yes, Ms. Markovich. Uh, yeah, I had a, a parking related question as well, actually. So um, in your written application, you indicated uh, you know, plans to have discussions with potential renters around minimizing uh, additional demand for on street parking. I'm just wondering if you can elaborate a bit about what that would look like and, and how the outcomes of those discussions might actually be kind of enforced or ensured if this proposal were to be approved. Sure, yeah, this was actually um, a suggestion uh, that I had uh, during my conversation with Councillor Laura Dudas. And so she has suggested, because I think that she had mentioned this to other people who were requesting this sort of uh, variance. And so the intent was that each unit uh, is easily uh, able to have one parking spot with the seventh being a visitor parking. So in terms of uh, having those discussions with uh, the future uh, residents of the building, it would be a matter of trying to minimize any overnight guests or anything that would uh, increase the use of the of the street as parking. Um, so, uh, in terms of having their visitors uh, re reduce the amount of uh, times that you know you're having to use the street, but in essence, the uh, the residents will get um, a one parking spot uh, regardless. Um, so, in that sense, we believe that won't be such a big um, a deal for most of the residents that are there and then in terms of the extra parking space because we only have the one it would be a matter of letting them know that you know they, they would have to reduce the amount of uh, parking in uh, on the street so if you just to follow on from that if you i'm noticing that um again in the application these units are two bedrooms so if you were looking at potential tenants with more than one vehicle if if on street is i'm just trying to better understand what what the options would be from my understanding available. yeah from my understanding um like i see the street right now there is a lot of cars parked on the street uh, regardless and i don't think there i'm not i'm not sure if there are any restrictions in terms of uh, visitors parking on the side i believe there probably will be in the winter time but that's the same as um, i think any other street so um, in terms of the the tenants there yes they are two um, two bedrooms per unit except for one there's only one bedroom um, but um, but yeah they would they would have to have just the one spot which would be given to each one and in terms of the um, the, uh, the the street parking is just a matter of us talking to them and letting them know that they try they have to try to minimize the uh, the street parking itself. It's more of a verbal conversation that we have to have with the tenants. Okay, uh, thank you. Other questions from the committee? So I, I have a couple of questions and Ms. Guzman myself. So um, I, I, I'd like to applaud, first off, the site plan for having a, an accessibility ramp at the front of the building. But I guess my only question though is in looking at your parking spaces, I, is there one that's actually designed for accessibility? In terms of what, sorry? Your parking spaces. I mean, I'm looking at the seven parking spaces. Are any of them, have you got one that's intended to be for uh, accessible parking? 
Um, not that I have specifically, not that, not that I, we've already put on there. Um, I don't believe that uh, we have been requested to do that uh, yet. Um, it wasn't a conversation that uh, has come up with my conversations with uh, Lucy, um, but if it, uh, maybe Lucy can, uh, uh, can let me know if there is a requirement to provide a specific one for, uh, for wheelchair uh, parking specifically. So Ms. Guzman, yes, I can get that clarification. So Ms. Ram uh, Ramirez, if you wouldn't mind uh, just uh, just confirming what I think, I think the answer is no. I don't think I think it, I don't no. think it's a requirement. But I just I I just I thought it, the site plan is so thoughtful in terms of having a ramp for accessibility, but there's actually no accessible parking spot. So I. Um, and I wondered whether or not, in fact, there'd, there'd be the possibility of, uh, of widening, maybe I'm thinking about oh. number seven or something like that in order to do it. But then I don't know what the impacts are on the rest of your requirements. So um, <laughs> that, you know, before, I'm, before we quickly kind of go to that, um, yeah. I, I, I don't know whether that would then affect your, uh, your landscaped area or any other requirements. Um, Ms. Ramirez, can you? Can you just uh, uh, chime in here a little bit and um, and let me know whether or not, you know, does that mean, uh, no, but then we'd be in a situation where we would need greater relief from the landscape um, area uh, if we were to do that. So anyway, it's an, it's just, I, I found it interesting. I thought it was great, but then I kind of saw that there was something here that seemed to be missing. So yeah, so I think I've answered my own question. Even if you did do it, you're gonna need greater relief and now we're back out of circulating to the yeah. application. Um, did you, by any chance, a couple of things. So let me, let me first, before I go to the consultation with neighbors, you made a, you made a comment, which I found really interesting. You said um, that the existing house, uh, that the setbacks, the reduction of setbacks is actually improving the situation over having a single family home on the lot. And I found that, I found that really, like so how wide is that bungalow because from the picture that you showed it looked like it was actually a fairly tiny little thing so can you mm -hmm. explain that yeah so on the western western side there's only a three um a, a two meter setback from the house to the actual to the townhomes that are next to it on the other side um there is uh it just it's it uh, hits the uh, the neighbor um laneway as well so by us inc adding the laneway uh on the lot um and then putting it next to the uh laneway on the other apartment building that's actually increasing the setback of what is there right now um and then on the other side where we have uh where we're abutting the uh townhomes it's two meters from our house to the townhomes and we're actually increasing that to three so that's what I meant by um, we're increasing the setbacks that currently exist today. All right. Okay. And just the last thing on consultation, um, I, I don't know that I saw that. Um, can you just give us a quick overview of what you did in terms of neighborhood consultation? Yes. So I actually walked the neighborhood twice. Um, the first initial time is uh, I knocked on the doors and left a... Um, a little notice to let them know what we were proposing. Um, unfortunately, the first time I had gone, uh, it was during the, the weekday, so I guess people weren't home, um, but I did leave the notes there. And um, in my note, I had left uh, my, my email address so somebody could contact me should they have any questions. Um, so I didn't receive any responses back from that. Um, so I, because we had to recirculate, I did go back and uh, left some more uh, notes again to let them know that there was a recirculation again. Um, I did receive one email from our, I believe it's the neighbor to the rear behind us. And uh, he was questioning about, um, about his privacy. So if we were going to be able to see the balconies we're going to be able to see uh, to his rear yard. Um, so I did explain to him that we could have um, in our balconies, we could have um, a bit of like a barrier, like a more of a design where the the residents could use the 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 balcony itself, but not necessarily have to 
have full view into his backyard. So try to minimize a little bit of that and, and um, not feel like we're impeding on his privacy. The other aspect that we talked about was that there is a buffer between his rear yard and us because of the, of the parking lot in the back. Um, so I don't expect it to be um, too, um, uh, too loud, I guess, in a sense. And, but we did talk about adding the fence so that if you know we have uh, the cars that are parked there and their lights are turned on, they're not necessarily going to um, you know blast right into his backyard. So we talked about putting um, a fence there um, to make sure to try to reduce the amount of light that is going into his rear yard. So that was a, a conversation that we had. All right, thank you. I did see Mr. White has his hand up. Mr. White. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, it's my understanding that the, the city has a bylaw requirement for the provision of accessible parking spaces based on, I, my recollection of the history is that based on the number of parking spaces required in a lot. Now I, I'm, I don't know what the number would be, but I wonder if Ms. Ramirez might have some handle on what that requirement might be for uh, accessible parking. It appears to me that the building code has some requirement for the ramp to be provided. Um, and it would seem to me that if there's a requirement for, for a ramp that your question about uh, accessible parking spaces is somewhat relevant. So I just wondered if the staff might be able to enlighten me on that, uh, what that requirement is based on the uh, parking numbers. Ms. Ramirez. Uh, for you, Madam Chair, the requirement is in our traffic and parking bylaw and it's 3.66 meters. And uh, for width, it's the same length, but um, uh, in sectional 111, it talks about the, um, for one to 19 parking spaces, there's a zero requirement for, has, for one that has to be reserved for people with disabilities. Okay, seems like it, it seems a little off, doesn't it? Yeah, so there's a requirement for the build for the building, but not for the parking. Yeah, anyway. yeah doesn't really quite make a lot of sense to me. All right, those are my questions. Anyone else? Okay. Have, sorry, yes. Madam Chair. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at your site plan, Ms. Guzman, and um, because you're not, you're proposing not to go through the site plan control process, you're reference to a fence i'm assuming that's on the south property line which is the neighbor that um they were con con concerned about um lights shining into their yard mm -hmm. but you're not showing a fence here on your site plan correct no there already exists a chain link link fence uh already there so it would just be a matter of uh, replacing what's uh, existing there with chain link fence no, it would be with like a real fence so that we uh, reduce the light going into the, the neighbor. But you're not showing that on the site plan? No, not okay. right now. It was just I a discussion. As well, I actually took a look at the, um, the property today. So all along the east property line uh, where you're putting the new drive, is that east? Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah, your east yeah. property line where the driveway is going in. There's quite a significant hedgerow all along um, the parking lot, both between the parking lot on the other side and the building on the other side. So with this driveway coming up close to the property line, I'm wondering if that tree line is going to be, all those trees are going to be lost, which does provide screening to the right off the balconies to the building next door. And what happens if uh, it turns out that you have to do a tree disclosure report, the trees have to be re retained and you can't you can't fit your driveway. I'm just wondering whether you've given consideration to the preservation of those trees and coming up with this design. Yeah, uh, to my understanding, when I spoke to my engineer about it, uh, he doesn't seem to believe there's anything that we would remove those hedges whatsoever. Um, so there's actually, the driveway is there right now and it would just be a matter of extending that driveway that it currently exists right now um, to the back. Uh, so we would just leave it, uh, the hedges would remain there. There is no, uh, there's no plans to remove those. Just to be clear, are those hedges on your property, Ms. Guzman? I believe so, yes. 
Okay, so I, I'm, I'm finding, I'm looking at the site plan and I'm thinking, I didn't see that hedgerow, but as well as, I guess I'll leave it to you to tell us. Well, I, I'm looking in front of the garage on, on your property, Ms. Guzman, and I can see your chain link fence along the side, but the, the, the trees are growing through the, it's kind of hard to tell past, and I couldn't go past that, but there are some quite significant trees. And I guess that's a question of, of staff potentially is if a tree is, has to remain and you can't build, because the driveway comes right up to, it's only a few inches away from the property line, it looks like to me. Yeah. So the roots would be, would be dealt with. I just don't know what happens if, if, if you get to get your building permit and it turns out that you've got to preserve some trees and you can't with this design, what happens? Maybe staff can help with that. Ms. Hermes. Yes, through you, Madam Chair, um, the tree disclosure report will give us information on distinctive trees and municipal trees. And they do ask for if there are neighboring trees that are going to be impacted, that you include them in that tree disclosure. And any construction activity that is going to impact neighboring trees um, has to be, should be discussed with, I should say should be discussed with the neighbor um, whose trees uh, you're going to impact. Um, it, if, if it's not a distinctive tree, um, and if it's going to be a tree that's impacted on the neighbor's yard, then it's a conversation that the neighbors have to have. And if they if the neighbor's tree are impacted, ultimately it could result, um, in civil action if, if it wasn't permitted. All right. So uh, now I'm not sure <laughs> are the trees on the property or not, like I guess at this point, so. The only tree that I, the tree is the actual tree that I know of that we have in the front uh, of the of the lot. Um, the rest is is uh, hedges, so I don't know if that's considered um, tree. Uh, the hedges are considered trees specifically, um, but the the only tree that uh, we've ever talked about, even within the city, has been uh, about the tree uh, in the front yard. All right. Ms. Ramirez, when you, res when you uh, reviewed this application, did you review it thinking that that hedgerow was on the property or on the subject property or on the abutting property? Um, through you, Madam Chair, uh, when I reviewed the, the drawings on GeoOttawa, the uh, 2007 aerial imagery looks like it's on 2441 Clareau. All right. Okay, well, Ms. Willis, did you have any follow-up uh, questions? Um, just, just these, these things are all things that would have been addressed through the site plan approval process, um, which is being averted because of the variance for the parking as one of the, one of the criteria. So I'm a bit concerned about that. And then when I add to that, the, um, the question about the right-of-way width of, um, what's the name of this, Clairou, and what that does, if you look at the, um, you can't get a road widening, as I understand it, through uh, variance application, but you can through site plan approval or subdivision approval. And it looks, when you're looking at Geo Ottawa, that their road is narrower as it fronts on this property than its neighbors, which would one day, if a road widening is taken, um, put this building even closer to the, to the right of way. So I don't know whether or not going through the site plan approval process would result in a road widening being granted to the city to ensure that it's designed in accordance with that road widening um, if, if um, there is one required. Through you, Madam Chair, um, I did take a look at Annex 1 of the official plan, which uh, outlines road widenings and the Clareau um, Street, there's no road widening outlined in that um, Annex 1. Okay, so it's not actually even identified in the OP as a, as a road widening. Okay, so that's fine. All right. In which case, Ms. Willis? I'm okay with it then. Yeah, I think so. I think it kind of uh, boils next, down to that. Next door. I, I agree with you, but uh, anyhow, it doesn't allow for any opportunity to add a bike lane down the road or anything like that uh, in the future, but anyhow. Okay, Ms., uh, Mr. Hindle. Um, Ms. Willis, given the conversation about the fence, is that something that you would want to see in, say, an unupdated site plan? Uh, yes, actually, thank you for reminding me. That's what I, because I, I suspected that on the what, easterly property line, that even if the trees are on the abutting, and there are a number of trees in there, 
um, that if they're if they are going to be damaged because of the installation of the pavement, that a, I would assume it would be a good alternative would be to put an obscuring fence along that property line if in fact the trees come out. But I don't know how we would control that. Are you, well, are I guess you along the side or along the rear. Along the side is where I I didn't see the rear property line. I only saw the side property line where. The, the side of the abutting apartment building has all the balconies looking out onto this property and they are obscured like it's it's they're looking right into the trees so when the if the trees have to come out we don't know that um they will be looking into the parking lot instead right yeah i think i'm less concerned about that one i think just the the conversation that came out that uh there's a bit of an agreement with the rear neighbor to to put in a fence yes i would um i would be inclined to potentially ask for an updated site plan that showed that fence at least along the rear property line i agree um, to ensure mr that white was ahead. ms markovich looking for your thoughts on that Yes, I, I would agree. I like that approach. Okay. All right. That's good. Mr. White. Did I lose Mr. White? Okay. Well, I guess at this point, Ms. Guzman, would you then, I think what the committee is saying is, um, is that we like the consultation that you've, you've undertaken. It's good that you've, you know, you've come to some agreement with, uh, with your neighbors about that. Um, not sure if we're asking for the site plan to be revised to show the side fence, but certainly that we would be looking for a revised site plan that would show the fence that you've agreed upon with your neighbor along the back. Um, are we looking for the side as well, committee, Ms. Willis, Mr. Hindle? I'm agnostic. Um... Okay, Ms. Willis. I, sorry, I, I'm not sure I understood the question is whether we should be asking for a fence along the, the other property line as well. Yes. I don't think it's necessary if the trees stay, but I just doubt the, the ability for the trees to stay, so. Okay. All right. Uh, in that case, then, you know, I'm just going to impose that the fence be um, shown on the uh, revised drawings uh, in the back because uh, because we we're, we've got to go with the evidence that's been provided to us with regards to that hedgerow being retained. So if that's the case, then uh, let's uh, let's just go with the uh, with the rear the rear portion. Is that agreed? We yeah, that works. Right. Okay. Um, so Ms. Guzman, if you understand, if your application is granted, then we would request that you get that that to us. Uh, how much time, Ms. Um, uh, Deputy Secretary Treasurer, Ms. War Ms. Brenning, can you tell us by when you would need that revised drawing? We would put that, uh, Madam Chair, through you, we would put that on as a condition and so the final and binding letter would not be issued until the revised site plan is submitted. Perfect. So that's a, is that a condition that we need to add here officially or is that an administrative condition? We would add it here officially, Madam Chair. All right, so how do you do that? How do you add a condition then on a minor variance application? We would just put it subject to in accordance with the plans filed as amended uh, to uh, include a site plan to include a um, fence um, all right. at the rear of the property. So that's actually then an, an administrative, the way that you're wording that you would use, simply use as amended in your wording so, okay, so, yeah, so we don't, yes, we can't correct. add, we can't impose a condition. We can't impose a condition. All we can do in this point is administratively change the wording to amend, as amended uh, to reflect uh, the fence portion, something like that, right? That, yes, that is correct, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Okay, we haven't, uh, Mr. White's not back yet. I'm sure he'll be joining us as soon as he can again. These things happen, <laughs> technology. <laughs> connectivity had my own issues this morning trust me um so i don't see anyone though from the public that has asked to speak to this application so i'm going to just open it up now to anyone uh in the any member of the public who would like to speak either for or against this uh this application now would be your chance
Okay, I'm not seeing anybody wanting to um, to speak to this. So I, I don't think there's anything further, Ms. Guzman, that we need to uh, to speak with you about. So I think at this point, Mr. White, your timing is excellent. We're going to a vote. <laughs> so all in favor, please, the application. All right, so Ms. Guzman, your application is granted subject to the amendment, the revised plan being okay. submit or being submitted and, and I'll, I'll let staff explain exactly how that works um, offline. And uh, so good luck uh, with your project. Great, thank you so much, everyone. You're welcome, have a nice evening. You too. Madam, okay. Madam Chair, I apologize, I had a crash in the uh, my internet. So. <laughs> uh, I was just saying, Mr. White, I had my, my own panic moment this morning when the speed in my internet dropped to like next to nothing. So, <laughs> oh goodness. All right. Uh, the next application then will be number six and seven for 203 Belmoral Place. And I'm looking for the agent, Ms. Belfi, and she has raised her hand. Come join us. <clears throat> good evening Hello. good evening <laughs> hi good to see you um we're going to ask you for a brief presentation on this one and uh if, if you don't mind just uh just quickly to run us through the both the consent and the um, minor variance application please yes <laughs> thank you got thrown off my game Ah, here we go. See, when I'm fast tracking the applications, it's all still fresh, but then we get into a lot of discussion and kind of loses, it jumps out of my mind. All right, so do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process by the committee was posted first um, on the property to which the application applies, secondly, for the prescribed time before the hearing, and thirdly, that the sign was both legible and clearly visible at all times. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that to be true? I solemnly swear. All right, thank you. Okay, with that, the floor is yours uh, on the presentation. I have two, uh, just two slides. If we could put the first one up, which is the draft for our plan. Um, this property that we're talking about on Balmoral is located on the north side of Balmoral. And it's actually located at the southwest corner of Smythe and Alta Vista. Balmoral doesn't extend straight through. Um, it ends just short of that uh, intersection. And then there's a walking path that goes through. Uh, the, uh, the purpose of the consent applications is obviously to create two lots uh, that you can see, part one and part two. Two. Part one on the draft for our plan will contain the existing home. There's no changes proposed to this home and there are no minor variances required for that particular lot. Uh, the zoning on the property is R1GG and it requires a lot area of 665 square meters and a lot width of 18 meters. Um, side yard setbacks a total of 3.6 meters with one uh, minimum yard no less than 1.2. So part one will meet or will actually exceed all these requirements. It will have 999.5 square meters of lot area, um, a lot width of 27.5 and the interior side yard setbacks will be 3.6 meters on the eastern side and 2.8 on the western side of uh, that existing home. Part two is going to be the new building lot. Um, it will also exceed the lot area requirement. It's going to be 917.5 square meters in size, um, which again exceeds the uh, lot area requirement. If you could move to the second slide, please. This is a concept plan that, uh, that we've submitted to show that there is uh, going to be sufficient room on this site uh, to build a home and also to, to, um, to illustrate how the lot width came for, um, was calculated for this particular triangular shaped lot. Uh, the mi a minor variance is required for this part two lot um, and it's to allow a lot width of 16.19 meters, whereas the zoning requires 18 meters. 
Um, as you can see on this plan, there is going to actually be 71.37 meters of lot frontage along Balmoral. But due to the technical nature of how you calculate lot width, um, which is shown uh, with the red lines on here, the actual lot width um, is going to be 16.19. The long red line that extends from the midpoint of the Balmoral uh, front lot line to the top of the diagram is actually the lot depth, is how you calculate lot depth. And then the short red line that crosses that lot depth is um, set at the six meter front yard setback, and that's how you measure lot width on a three sided lot. Um, we've also shown on here, there's a dashed line and some labels showing the, uh, the setback. There's a, a front yard setback of six meters, a 1.2 meter setback on the west side, 4.5 meter exterior lot long, uh, side yard along Smythe. And the rear yard, because it's a triangular, is um, actually it's 7.5 meters, but it's taken from the point where the interior and exterior lot lines uh, uh, join at the top of the property. Um, so the intent is, um, is to build obviously on the west side of this lot, the deeper portion of the lot. Um, we're showing where the driveway could potentially come in um, and come around to the, uh, to the garage on the side and using the depth of the lot to create, a, to create the, uh, build the home at this point. The intent is to leave the trees up in the eastern side of the uh, property. Um, the, we've done a topo survey on the property and there are no distinctive trees on this site. There's a fair amount of underbrush and some small, smaller trees, but uh, the intent is to keep up, to keep things naturalized to the east and along the rear property line along Smythe Road as well. Um, so th that's, uh, uh, there's no minor variances other than for the lot width that would be required for part two, where the intent is to build within the required zoning setbacks. That's my presentation. All right, thank you very much. Questions for Ms. Belfi from the members of the committee. Anyone? All right, it was interesting Ms. Belfi because um, one of the panel members had noted during our earlier discussion that the lot is heavily treed. And I see from your site plan that, that there is, there's an effort to really retain as much as possible, particularly on the Smythe Road frontage and the cluster that's also very much at the corner. So that, um, that's actually, um, I, I hope in fact that that's how the lot is eventually developed. I don't know whether or not you actually have somebody designing it now and in, in the way that you demonstrated, but it, it, I certainly hope that that happens. Um, the owner of the property um, is in the building industry and has been working on the design so that, so it, um, when they were working on where you could actually place the house, obviously the, the deeper the lot, the better. And so that was, uh, that might be somewhat similar to what could be the final plan, but it's not, um, you know, it was just to show that you can actually accommodate a home on what's left on that right. lot. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, was there anything, I guess the one issue that, uh, that came up for us uh, during our discussion had to do with one of the conditions. And we, we noted, we, we got some correspondence um, from, I think it's transportation, somebody correct me, but which had to do with, uh, with a nearby rail, active rail corridor. And so um, in looking at the, um, at the conditions, condition number one asks for a noise attenuation study that's directly related to the arterial road um, I guess Smythe, that's uh, right next door. I guess the whole property is pretty surrounded by you know, minor, major collectors and arterials. So, um, so that makes a lot of sense. But in lieu of the comment that, uh, that we got about the rail corridor, um, it seems to me that, uh, I believe just from my experience, that when we're talking about rail, it's both noise and vibration. And I think the environmental noise control guidelines, and I think it includes the whole vibration piece. It doesn't say it, but I think it's actually in it as well, in the guidelines. So I, I wondered what um, what you thought if if maybe we could we could you know expand that condition slightly to um, to include uh, having to to consider vibration and to consider uh, the rail 
corridor, the nearby rail corridor. Had you thought about that? Had you? Uh... Uh, the noise attenuation would be looking at sound. So they, uh, so if there, I guess if there was sound coming from the from the rail corridor, it would be there. I'm not sure about the vibration. I have never seen that in a noise study, but um, you may have way more experience with that than I would. So um, the, the requirement was for the noise study and uh, for noise attenuation, and we didn't have an issue with that. Uh, typically, um, you know, depending on what it is, you, there's um, air conditioning vents, the ducting is uh, so sized windows, that kind of thing. Um, you'll note that the uh, sort of the outdoor amenity area um, was put at the front of the site plan. They were looking at probably having like a patio area at the front of the building as well. So um, there has been some thought given to that. Um, the owner does live right next door and is aware of what the, uh, what the noise is in the, in the neighborhood. So, all right, so I'm just gonna ask it, and you know, I'm, I'm no expert either, um, Ms. Belfi. So Ms. Ramirez, on this application, can you, can you just um, give us your thoughts here with regards to whether or not vibration is a consideration at all, or I think it's Ms. Ramirez on this application, is it not? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, the official plan speaks to vibration studies that are required within 75 meters of the rail right of way. Um, the guidelines do speak to, um, uh, just let me pull them up right now. I had them up a second ago. Um, um, the stationary sources of noises, um, there's it's section three, and uh, it represents the combined sound and vibration levels emitted um, beyond the property boundary. So um, does that answer your question? Uh, no, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm pretty confused. <laughs> so does that oh. mean that we should be adding the words and vibration or, or not? Um, <laughs> there is a, a separate vibration study that is uh, required if you're close to the railway, but our guidelines do uh, include the, the, some language uh, that represents the combined sound and vibration levels. So um, I'm, it's not a, a vibration study on its own isn't needed, but as long as it's in um, in keeping with the guidelines that we have, um, it, it should be taken into consideration. So, all right. So, are we adding the words to condition number one, or or not? Was um, in your mind? In your mind, does it make sense to do that based on the discussion we just had? The in, in my mind, you could actually strike out the arterial road. That was just sort of to give you information on why it's there. Um, if it's in line with our guidelines, our guidelines will cover, um, they're, they're 106 pages long. They, they go into what they cover um, within them. All right, so anyone, an acoustical engineer who would be undertaking these things would know automatically what to be looking for, would do their, his own recognizance of all of the elements within the the parameters around the property that might influence and then go from that right yes is that what i'm understanding okay yeah. in that case i'm i'm not i'm going to withdraw my proposal to change anything to do with that that condition so um that's fine i just thought it was it would be you know a good thing to have that discussion just so that we're not you know just being mindful of the comments that came in from um from i guess it was our transportation um sector section in the city right i'm not sure i can't remember exactly who sent that comment in in any event okay so good any other elements before i open this up to uh public hearing okay all right i have the possibility of um, the faircrest community association's representative judy per per uh Corici. is is um is Corici here and i'm sure i'm not pronouncing that correctly. Okay, I wanted to give her the first chance if she was uh, with us this evening. Um, not seeing any hands raised, so I'm going to, I'm going to open it up to anyone else from the public who may want to speak either for or against this application. Applications, I guess. All right, not seeing anyone. All right, committee members, I am looking for your, uh, your guidance. Are we all in favor of both the consent applications and the minor variants? All right, so um, Ms. Belfi, I think you, you saw that in fact, 
it was uh, unanimous. So I don't think there's anything else. And I, I take it you've looked at the conditions, all of the conditions, you're familiar with anything that's required on this uh, in terms of the, the application. So anything? yes, we have. We've looked at the conditions where, and we don't have any questions about them. All right, perfect. In that uh, case, I think uh, we're concluded. So thank you so much for uh, joining us. Thank you. All right, thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right, I think that brings us to, by my account here, the last application for the evening, which is going back to our friends at uh, 1821 and 1833 Prince of Wales. So I'm looking for the agent, Mr. Don Brown. Okay. I see the owners, Mr. McMullen, both Mr. All right, so I see two owners there and I see the same names. So, so we're gonna to have to get some clarification from, from you fellows, but our, so. Hey, yes. I'm, I'm here now, I was muted, sorry. Is, are now, who, now who are you just exactly? Cause I have two, two Carl McMullens and no, no Don Brown. Sorry, I answered that, but I noted uh, it went blank here for a moment, and then I noted it was muted, and you didn't get my answer. I apologize. Uh, I'm Don Brown, the agent for Mr. McMullen. We just happened to be across the living room at Mr. McMullen's home, and therefore on the same Wi-Fi, and that's why it's coming up this way. Ah, okay, that's fine. That's fine then. Great. Okay. Well, so um, I believe I need to do the oath or solemn declaration. So, and is it you then, Mr. Brown, or will it be Mr. McMullen who will be um, doing the declaration or the oath here? I asked him earlier, he said I could carry it if you're okay. All right, that's fine. Um, so with that, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted first at the property to which the application applies? Uh, for the prescribed number of days before the hearing, and finally, that the sign was clearly visible and legible during the entirety of that time. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that to be true? We do affirm. It went up the night of, and it's still outside now. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. So with that, then, Mr. Brown, we're going to ask you for a brief presentation on both the consent application and the minor variance. Very well. Uh, if I may speak as briefly as much as this can be. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Fackberg, can we get uh, set number one up, please? Page one. There she is. Okay, uh, just very quickly, um, this is the, just for general uh, referencing of what we're dealing with here. This is the Rideau River view with the building uh, put into the existing uh, treescape um, and that is the two-story element that's in the middle and the other homes Mr. McMullen and I are currently in the residence to the right which is just right of center line and uh, number two please page two uh, just very quickly that top box is the summary of uh, remarks from the cultural heritage planner etc and that it ultimately had no issue with that um, I should have mentioned this section here is with regards to consultations and general introduction. Apologies. Uh, the last part, we don't need that got uh, looked after. That's uh, been expunged. Uh, page three, please. Uh, in the matter of doing due diligence and, uh, and consultation, these represent as a big long list of all the people and persons who have been party to this and have shown ultimately the support. Uh, some are with us tonight and others uh, through the process. Uh, the first one on the top, you'll notice are the five neighbors uh, as abutting uh, on each side of the site have uh, given their support as well as two of them across the street, some verbally, some uh, in, uh, in copy. Uh, page four, please. And that represents uh, the brown building uh, with the star represents the site of note and the patterning of the waterfront, uh, most specifically here. Uh, the stars represent those people who offered their, uh, they were all approached those stars and they all gave their consent of, uh, of uh, support. Uh, the other bars, uh, one was a rental and the others were further down the street. 
the underlined ones were ones who did it with a written uh, notation. Um, and can we, can we, sorry, uh, if we can flip through, click, 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 just through to five, six, seven, eight, to number eight, please. Okay, well, there was a series of the letters. <laughs> they all disappeared in one. Uh, this one following on an earlier discussion right from the beginning, just with regards to right-of-ways and uh, such, this is a letter of uh, acknowledgement and support for a portion of what we're doing with regards to the variance of a little hammerhead uh, T turnout, which allows vehicles from this property ultimately to be able to back into that and then swing and enter the arterial road principally in a forward direction. And uh, this was from uh, Lorene DiNardo um, and also Ms. Karkner from the right, right away was involved in that. Um, so we have had communications with right of -ways. Uh, It was only, I think, yesterday the day before I noted some of the remarks made early on uh, right at the top. And in that regard, I'll just talk to them a little bit as I go. Uh, could I get set number two, please, uh, Ms. Papworth? This is set up in terms of blocks of, I, I don't know if you've received the, um, these slides. This is a condensing electronically of what was submitted in March uh, for, uh, for this, although it got stamped in because of COVID uh, was just a week or something before, and it was stamped in May. Um, this represents in blue the existing parcel and if you've, I believe, all have read what's going to be happening here as part of the consent, the portion on the river side to the right of the blue, that segment by continuance is currently held with what is the L and is being transferred to the blue section and will go straight through to the river. Um, this is actually from Terra View, uh, illustrating the um, the co, the, how can I put it? Each property has its own ownership, okay? The 1821, which is labeled as uh, 618 uh, pin number, uh, was, per, was created in 1942, house built 45, and the other is created in 1963 under consent of LPAB, not LPAB, sorry, Ottawa Planning Area Board, uh, but was never built upon. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is a cute, <laughs> sorry, oblique, uh, and it shows the uh, site in the context of the riverscape. Uh, Mr. McMullen's property uh, where he's residing is 1821 to the right of the vacant parcel. Um, the obliqueness suggests that there's not quite so much grass, but if you look at it straight on, it's grassed uh, from the roadside all the way down to the water. Um, there's a red line on there just as a between the adjacent neighbors, 1819, 1845. And that was the basis of discussions with the Rideau Valley Conservation with regards to establishing a development limit line that we would work with and ultimately through working with them over time, uh, the building proposed design to respect that and the fact that Mr. McMullen has a walkout basement patio that also follows the same lines. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is taken from across the river, uh, springtime. It may be a little hard depending upon your scale, but just quickly, if we see in the middle where it says 100 year flood, uh, you'll notice that there is a gray berming going along there. The two properties to the right, 1819 through to 1845 in 1978 had a hardened uh, berm uh, placed by HIHO and everything else It's contract con compacted hard granular and it comes up normally about nine feet from the normal navigation level and then has a flat plateau and beyond that going up and you can see inferred uh, by the grass there there is a uh, double terracing in there and um, Mr. McMullen actually mows that lawn with a hand mower well power mower but push by hand so this is amongst the lowest slope along the river at that point um, as part of Rio Valley, the shoreline is not being modified except for just allowing a small step to a dock uh, and the existing uh, indigenous trees and sumacs and things that have been growing there now for uh, 50 years, um, or sorry, 40 years, um, will retain. There's no issue there. Uh, if we could just quickly skip the 
quickly next next and uh next please thank you this is a uh, rendering based upon uh, the discussions of right away as to how this fits within the context the house is narrower uh, but taller by one story. Uh, there are numerous two-story houses along the shoreline going to the north of this. There's some being built to the south of this. And as you keep going uh, along about a, a two-kilometer stretch of the river, 63% uh, of the buildings facing the river are two-story, and 50% uh, of those have walkout basements. So this condition fits within that context. Uh, coming just Again, speaking to the introduction you made about the fence, uh, you can see it represented in this situation here. Um, these fences predate 1982 and or beyond that, I haven't looked back in the photographs of so their uh, existing conditions. The fencing in front of the new would obviously be removed. Uh, we were hoping to maintain or create just an L return for continuity as well as just to um, give a, a bit of a visual baffle to what is that turnout T, which you'll see in the right of the driveway in behind that fence. So the cars can back into it and swing out to the street. Uh, that is where one of the variances applies. It's only a two square meter piece of land. Uh, and the approval of the right of ways that I showed you represented their approval from the lot line outward to the street as the companion that thus allows for that uh, to occur. Uh, next, please. Okay, this uh, is a cross section through the site, which uh, describes many different things. The variances are bubbled off here, uh, will be spoken to in more detail. Hopefully you can grant me a bit of time because there's a numbers of things going on here. Uh, to the left of center and next to the river, uh, you can see the winter and the regulated water levels but you can also see at 100-year uh, flood notated there that this is not a flood susceptible site. It's not a floodplain type environment. Um, and it is an existing lot of record that was meant to be built upon. So in that sense, that is wherein we come to you today. The gray section from the shoreline, that represents the uh, hardened limestone rock berm that was set with high hose and tractor compactors, everything else back in. 78 and you can see where the old slope has been in the 1978 terracing and the light and color peachy kind of color and uh, how the house is being designed to respect that uh, going up through the mid terrace which is the lower walkout level you'll notice a dash line that is where the upper terrace currently is uh, and that is going to be pulled back to assimilate a stair up to grade uh, coincidentally, that does not affect 1821 at all because that is how the stairs currently are on 1821. And 1821 to 1833 has a retaining wall that will disappear and basically they will be, nominally speaking, coplanar level with each other. Um, the, so the variances I'll come back to essentially, but uh, uh, they are represented in there. Could I please, uh, Ms. Papworth, just quickly jump to what is titled as site plan and elevations, please? Thank you. Uh, this is a, a good frame just to quickly uh, try and come back to the first point of discussion with regards to the fence. Uh, specifically, if we look at the residence, which is toned up, and then 1821 to the right. Um, the distance actually with regards to, and I have the survey sitting next to me, on the right-hand side of 1821 to the lot line is 5.41, 5.42 meters. And on the other side, it's just a little bit less than that. So it's about 5.24 or something like that is a tiny little bit of angular drift going on in there. Um, moreover, if we come back to the lot line common to them, you'll notice that from the lot line, not the fence line, but from the lot line to the traveled edge of pavement, we have nine meters currently. And moreover, if we see up uh, in the road right away, it's a 28.2 meter right of way, which is 92 and 
half feet, I think, if I remember the number. So it is a substantial right of way, and hence that's why there is no widening in the contemplation uh, as you go. Okay, um, just quickly, this also just illustrates a couple of things. If we notice on the far, if I'm talking too fast, are we good? We're good? We're not talking yes, to that? Yes, we are. No, no, it's fine. Fine. Oh, it's been just trying to get a lot in and not as much time. So down the left hand, the lot line of 1833, you'll notice a, uh, a drainage easement, which is uh, 3.1 meters wide that we need to respect. Uh, within that starting and running obliquely up to the road uh, is a two foot wide uh, storm drain. And the intention and the uh, tacit approval verbally with regards to tie-in is to take the weeper water and any roof water from this uh, building site downhill in that orange colored pipe and dog leg it into the two foot uh, and out to the um, by all by gravity. Uh, the neighbor to 1845 to the left also shares, uh, shares is a bad word, has on their side a 3.1 meter drainage easement, but that only comes into play up near the road. Okay, and for the most part, down that uh, common lot line, uh, there is a set of trees and whatever that we'll talk to a bit afterwards, but it's substantially uh, being retained. Um, <clears throat> and the gas and water will go across the street. And if you look right up in the right-hand corner of the red rectangle, there's a black dot and that is the end of a sewer manhole for sanity, sanitary sewer. And we are going to intercept that first leg thereafter at 45 degrees from the house. And all the servicing is in that corner. So uh, the site is serviced. We don't need to, unless it comes up for some reason, to move the manhole over, which I don't think we need to do from my discussions with them. Uh, the servicing is there for the site there. We are not short of servicing. Um, if we could please go to number three, consent. Thank you. So this is a graphic, although I think we've spoken to it, but essentially the red square is the 1942 property, the green square is the 1963 property, which have um, legal status in the sense right now they are owned actually by different parties. So there's no questioning of that, but they had through their time because it was created under legal consent, again, of the Ottawa Planning Board, Area Planning Board. Um, the blue represents the first, uh, well, the yellow, I should come back to that um, berm along the waterfront that was created in 1978, created what is called made land, that yellow box along the river. And that was for partially soil stability and, and everything else because of the corner. Uh, it was driven not by this property, but actually the one to the right of it. But in the process, the property to the right, these two elements, and the property to the left all got this elevated high hardened berm, which essentially has shown no erosion uh, through those 40 years. Indeed, there is an eddy that turns the river back on itself in front, so the water's quite quiet. So the yellow represents the uh, purchase from Parks Canada which came through and was finalized in 2017 and by way of the Planning Act got merged uh, under co-ownership uh, status with what is uh, the red box. So currently um, the McMullins as husband and wife own the L. So the action is to take the cross between yellow and green and swing it 90 degrees counterclockwise to the blue line so that the uh, smaller green property now would then be through to the river and both become once again uh, riverfront properties. Um, if I could please, uh, just trying to go ahead here a little quicker. Okay. The uh, process of consent uh, basically is, is what that is. So it's a consent to technically do a severance but no new properties are being created. These are two individually owned title properties. In fact, City of Ottawa has assigned the 1833 address to it since I asked them to. It's waiting for the official final registration to 
literally make it final. Um, so if I could please go to the variance number four. Okay, so the property as it would then now become by way of the consent being granted in conjunction with that now these um, aspects with regards to developing this previously never developed uh, but created for development property are as follows. So in summary on this uh, page here, if we sort of uh, go by way of lettering, excuse me here just for a second while I cue myself like a uh, the lot area A is the variance of the lot area. Um, currently, um, as you can see, it is not so large. It's kind of being grown by, uh, it's about 180 square meters or something to that effect. But what it does become is 603 square meters, which is 90.7% uh, of the 665 meter requirement. Uh, the 1821 lot is uh, 672. So it is compliant in area and frontage as the residual from consent. I should have mentioned that, I apologize. And the process of consent, this is an 18.9 meter frontage property, which also is in the uh, uh, acceptable for the bylaw. So it's only the lot area in that regard, which is being discussed with variance A. And our contention is that it meets uh, the four tests and is indeed minor. Um, Ms. Ramirez will be speaking to that later. Uh, they came to the same um, resultant on that. Uh, coming up to the top, the arrow going between the garage, which is the blue line to the lot line at 3.0 meters is variance B from six meter. Um, You've been down this way many times with regards to waterfront properties and the development of the same. If you look right at the bottom, you'll can see where the rear yard is seven and a half meters is only halfway upward to where the house is actually going to be. So that puts pressure on the building to be towards the road to satisfy the Rita Valley and whatever. Uh, that in consort with this right of way being 28 meters wide uh, means that there really is no huge pressure with regards to the frontage. Um, the as paved pavement at the driveway, you can see how it sloops, sweeps through the T and then around and back in the actual uh, edge of pavement to edge of uh, shoulder at that point is only about uh, two meters or so like that. So this has the full appearance as if on the street driving by that the lot is actually much deeper than. Uh, variance C with regards to the height of the building. Again, uh, coming back to uh, the context of, pardon me for a second, the uh, context of a sloping site. Um, that we would contend that any property that slopes up or slopes down uh, runs folly of the height uh, bylaw with regards to average height. Uh, and in this case as well, just as a side quick note, um, that because the site is terraced and starts off with a initial transition to a flat plateau and goes up, the lower level from which the um, the uh, elevations are measured nearest the river is actually just at the low plateau as opposed to much of the high slope waterfronts along here which rise up at 30 to 40 degrees from the water so your seven and a half meters in is a substantially higher point off the river so we are at the detriment of the calculation uh, because of the topography uh, also being terraced and that comes into play also at the top because the terracing starts and the upper reference points for, for the average grade are then down below the level of the road, whereas other lots have a bit more plateauing before they descend to the river, then they're higher. So it works out to about almost a three meter uh, difference between this on the terrace versus if it went more to the water and then did a 30 degree slope to the water. So that's why the number seems so high. Um, Again, it is uh, not having to reprofile the site. Um, if we could pull up, uh, please, Ms. Papworth, uh, number two, page seven again, please. 
All right, so Mr. Mr. McMullen, I'm going to ask you to get to your last minor right. variance at this point. Oh, well, uh, I apologize. It's Don Brown, by the way. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> oh, boy. It's, it's, it's I, I, getting I late. Part, I was just going back to the uh, profile to, to illustrate that. Uh, okay, there we are. Okay, you can just see by way of all of that. And go back, please, uh, to uh, number four, page one, please. Thank you. And I apologize for, I'm trying to push, uh, squish in a lot. Um, thank you. Okay, there we are. Uh, the turnout at the top is variance E, and that's that little curved arc triangle, which permits the cars to back into the, uh, the where it says the right of way department has approved this area. So from the lot line forward to the street, the right of ways letter that I showed you uh, speaks to that. And in consort is this little two meter little arcing corner to transition the car turning backwards into it. Uh, again, deemed in all senses uh, to be minor. Uh, I skipped over D is the distance from the building to the water. Uh, variance D represents the least distance to the water because we don't really have any rear yard variances because we're not in the rear yard. This all relates to uh, the section with regards to proximity to water and waterfront. Uh, in that sense, these three balconies are cantilevered off the structure, so there's no foundation under them. The foundation follows the building warm line and 14.6 meters to the controlled high water level. Uh, the other corner which is nearest for the building shell is to the right of that next to the 1821 lot line and that's 15.7 meters. Uh, it's not showing on here initially. I talked to when I first put this in, uh, Grant says, well, it seems to be duplicating because the other one's closer, just take it off. Um, I believe Lucy may wish to discuss that at the end. She may be looking to add it just as a housekeeping measure. Um, but it is further back to the road. So the least of clearances that we're uh, referencing here is the 14.6. Um, excuse me. If we uh, could, if we could go please to page two. I'm going to flip through these ones quite quickly. So this one relates to the lot area on the red squares, 603, etc., and the other one retained. Uh, page three. Thank you. And again, this is just regarding the garage to the three meter. Uh, you'll notice also the way the building has been designed. I designed it to also um, take reference to 1821 being set back at about 5.2 meters. And you'll notice that the three meter only represents itself in front at the garage, it's uh, face wall. And then it steps back six feet, comes back out too. So if you're looking inward from south to north on the road, uh, the house planes off towards the front wall of uh, 1821. So it's not just a cube, it's actually articulated. And that articulation is also in the building shell above. Uh, next, please. This is actually, I should have done rather than dancing backwards, pardon me. Um, so in this case, the average grade here, because of what all I've mentioned and the fact it's, that here's Mr. Mr. Brown. Mr. Yeah, Brown, so I guess I, I guess I was looking. We've we've sort of seen some evidence on this already. If, if the committee okay. has more questions, okay. I think they can come all back. Right. Well, these have you, have you had a chance to, in your mind to to tell us about all of the minor variances at this point? Yes, that is them. Uh, these five that were just uh, expanding the image to represent each one, two, three, four, five. Okay. But, all right. How about we pause there? And um, and so that was a very fulsome, uh, and thank you for that uh, presentation. So it's always good to have uh, more rather than less information. Uh, but at this point, I think the committee, and we do we do remember have a chance to to review some of this material in advance. The only thing I'd like to say though is um, I'm mindful that I think that you had provided us this presentation at a very late in the day today. So Mr. Brown, all I can say is. For those of us who work until 4.35 o'clock, didn't get a chance to see it, just so you know. 
No, with, <laughs> with so apologies, so there's, uh, it means a lot to the owner, so I was trying to be complete. Um, uh, okay, it's just you. that uh, to be to be very you. very honest with you, that's not the kind of thing we we have any time to look at at all. So I just wanted to okay. let you know it's, sure. it's great work. Just get it to us two days before, <laughs> so that we can see it. Um, so that's it. All right, members of the uh, of the committee, any questions for Mr. Brown at this point? No. Okay. Well, that tells you a lot about how good your presentation is. We have no all questions. Right, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I have, I have a, uh, just a question about this, the front of the, the, the streetscape again. Um, I'm wondering if we could go to the diagram that showed the, uh, it was sort of a schematic of the front, an overhead on uh, from the, the street side. Uh, yes, the oblique. Uh, that would be uh, set two and page six. Yeah, page six. Uh, page six. That's the one there. Um, right. I gather that the fence that I see on that diagram is the fence as it is today. Right is now, it, yes, it is. It actually continues right through across the vacant lot as well. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm seeing uh, some green that is occupying, obviously, it's on the road allowance because it's outside the it's outside the fence. Um, that green where you have your your turnaround, your T or whatever you you're referring to, um, that green would be taking up. Correct me if I'm wrong, but we would be taking up existing asphalt. No, actually, if I may speak to that, uh, currently, and that was in my hammerhead T-bone, I made a remark with regards to street word of that, that actually is already grassed. And the perception on driving from the south to north is that the house is so much further back. What happened historically is that they uh, created a swale. And if you look at that gray dot to the left of the driveway, that represents a, uh, a swale and a uh, catchment for taking the uh, road water off Prince of Wales. Okay. okay, and that's what's going on with that uh, pavement that keeps on going to the left. But indeed the house to the right and that green in front of the T is there. They exist as do the plants. So, okay. so there's no change to that? None at all. Okay. There's no change. This represents essentially just missing a piece of fence. So that, that it's paved surface in that location then is roadway. There's there's no boulevard between that green space and the uh, and the, the actual roadway. Uh, well, the green space has about a five or six foot distance to the traveled road edge. If you notice, there's a little white line there. Okay. There is a bit of shoulder for for bicycles. Okay, so as they there is a bicycle painted line. If you looked on this drawing here, you'll see it top and bottom on each side of the yeah. traveled roads. They exist. And what we are doing affects that in no way at this time. So, um, Madam Chair, just to confirm with staff that the the uh, concern that was expressed or the comment that was expressed with respect to the maintenance of the bike lane is not compromised by by anything we see here. Um, all right, so Ms. I guess is it Ms. Ramirez on this one? Yeah. Yes, okay. So Ms. Ramirez, can you enlighten us? And I guess the other question I have then, Mr. Brown, do you have an, an aerial shot of this that we can actually see um, see sort of the, the, the actual uh, situation? I, I was getting there, to be honest. <laughs> uh, if we please pull up uh, number eight, if I label that the way the tree, ver the tree versus easement. That's probably the best shot I've got here at hand right now. There we go. Okay, so this is straight up and down. Uh, the easements are labeled and lined out in pink, the yellow line being lot line. The blue represents the near wall and corners of garage front to a uh, built house. Uh, and um, you can see if you're following the driveway of the adjacent neighbor in the bottom and their concrete brick paver pad, uh, I actually underestimated that probably is about a 10 foot wide bike capable shoulder. I apologize. Okay, and you'll see the fence 
slightly shadowed, but it, but oblique in view. You can see it, uh, um, and you also see where that asphalt returns to it. Okay, about uh, ten feet uh, from the lot line projection. In fact, if you take the uh, the easement projection to the asphalt, you'll see it's where the transition of the plants and the grass become asphalt going northward. Thanks for that. I, I am going to return to Ms. Ramirez at this point. Ms. Ramirez, can you answer Mr. White's uh, question then about um, about whether or not there's would be some you know some impacts to the extent to that would compromise the ability to have. Um, the bike path, I guess that's the, the piece that we're, we're concerned about. Okay. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, there's approximately five meters from the property line to the paved shoulder and approximately 8.8 .8 to the existing travel lane. Uh, the functional designs do show um, a cycling lane on the opposite side, but not on this side, um, but not adjacent to the 188, um, sorry, 1833 principle. All right. Okay. So, Mr. White, oh. does that answer your question, or do you need more information? Sorry, you're on mute, Mr. White. That's fine. Thank. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Ramirez. Any other questions for this application? Um, Madam Chair, through you, if I could add another uh, comment. The um, Right of way has signed uh, provided a letter to um, Mr. Brown, but uh, to new encroachments would require um, an encroachment agreement with the city um, for new encroachments. That, sh that should be noted there. So right, thank that, you. that fence would require a new encroachment. And per the bylaw, um, just because there is an encroachment, it doesn't mean that there's an absolute right to that encroachment forever. All right, okay, thank you for that, uh, that clarification and that information. I think that's very useful. So Mr. Brown, I take it you're aware of that of the rules with regards to the encroachments? Uh, yes, what she's referring to is that little L piece of fence 10 by 10 in the corner that was, um, it goes all but to that corner and we we're just hoping to put it in the corner. So I take her point, yes, with regards to, we would have to get a secondary approval just for that piece of fence if it goes forward. Uh, right. Ramirez, would that be true if it was only three feet high? All right, so I think, Yes, please answer that question. But if you don't mind, Ms. Brown, you I ask questions for me, if you wouldn't I mind. Want to so, um, Ms. Ramirez. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, if it is a permanent encroachment, that we would need uh, an encroachment agreement for fences. Um, as far as I know, we, we still need th those agreements. I think so, too, actually. That sounds, uh, that sounds about right. An encroachment is an encroachment. I don't think we, we start to differenti differentiate against, you know, whether we like one or the other, depending on certain criteria. So um, anyway, OK, at this point, um, I'd like to get to the, uh, the members of the committee have no other follow on questions. Uh, I'd like to get to the public portion of this. I have no registered speakers at this point to, um, to speak to this application. So, um, uh, and I guess uh, before we go there, I see Mr. Batchelor, you're with us. You're still with us on this. Is there anything that you wanted to add to this app about this application? Anything that, um, that may be pertinent at this point that we didn't, haven't talked about already? I just want to make sure that you have your chance to uh, have a say. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I would just add that um, we did ask for a condition to be placed on there. I believe the city asked for a similar condition on the consent, and that's just uh, that a development agreement be registered, um, acknowledging that uh, there are very specific uh, geotechnical requirements to allow this development to happen safely, and we want to make sure that whether it's the current owner or any subsequent owner, uh, that they're aware of that. Thank you very much. In fact, yes, we did talk about that. So, Mr. Uh, Brown, you are aware you've seen the wording for that condition? Uh, yes, we had full, well, you had a geotech ahead of time with regards to this for the slope stability, but then when it comes to the actual house, there will be a second phase of that before the house. All right. So, I think, though, you, you do understand that we're adding a condition then based That's on right. the input from the Mr. Condition uh, fine and understood. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Okay, uh, then I think I, I had opened up the public hearing portion. So uh, if there's anyone who would like to address the committee, please let me know. I'm seeing two individuals, 
Mr. Leaf and Ms. Lohesi. Okay, you're on mute, please. <laughs> we'll try again. Okay. All right, good evening. So I don't have you registered, so I'm going to need to get both of you to just, for the record, state your names again and your municipal address, please. Allison Cloacy, 1845 Prince of Wales Drive, Ottawa, Ontario. And my right. name is Andrew Lee. Same address? Uh, different address, 69 Waterford Drive, I'm, but I'm here in support of my partner, Allison. All right, okay, thank you. All right, in that case, um, I'm. Please uh, go ahead and, um, and provide your comments. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, Carl and Don were very good to consult with us uh, some months ago. Um, and we uh, did have uh, one uh, significant concern that hasn't been uh, touched on. Uh, and that is with, uh, and one of the slides showed it, it shows a lot of greenery along the property line between 1845 and this, and this new lot. Uh, the building will be um, quite high. So it's my comments are in respect of the minor variant C with respect to the height and to a lesser extent with minor variant D, which is the setback from the river. Um, so both with respect to privacy, soil retention and uh, general character of the area, um, uh, Allison and I are concerned uh, about the preservation of the greenery, uh, specifically the hedgerow that runs basically the length of the property down to the water. And in fact, uh, in the city um, brief to you uh, in support of uh, or discussing these variances, uh, with respect to uh, variance C, um, it mentions on paragraph two of page nine that, and I'll just quote, uh, from um, the third sentence, further that the impact, and that being the impact of the minor variance for height, will be mitigated along the southwest lot line. Uh, there's a mix of tall shrubs, mature deciduous trees at the shore with mature cedar headrow in parallel with a row of mature evergreen trees, effectively obscuring views from the river and between the lots. The, so that was quoted in the city um, comments as a positive thing. Uh, which we uh, agree with since the height will be kind of overlooking this property and and the privacy and the look and feel is mitigated a lot by that hedgerow, which isn't considered a distinctive tree, so wouldn't be normally in the forestry plan. So our concern is that, uh, and we're hoping that, um, uh, that, uh, that uh, Carl and uh, Don uh, will not have a problem with this or the, or the city is building in uh, to this approval, uh, some um, consideration for the preservation of this uh, of this hedgerow in particular, and some of the uh, smaller trees that are effectively providing a buffer um, uh, between the between the lot uh, between the two lots. Um, so, if that could be done, uh, we'd be very happy with the proposal. Um, if it can't, then we have concerns, and we're kind of concerned that. Uh, both in the construction of the uh, new building that perhaps uh, aggressive trimming by a contractor or digging the foundation will encroach into the roots and thereby uh, in, perhaps inadvertently um, uh, damage this to where, um, to where the um, greenery that's shown in the uh, slides that were just presented uh, will disappear and that barrier will disappear. So that's our, our primary concern. All right, thank you. So Mr. Brown, I'm gonna let you respond to that if you would. And I, and I guess um, one of my questions then uh, as a result of Mr. Leaf's comments is whether or not you have um, consulted with an arborist uh, for the construction of the site to ensure that that kind of, um, of, uh, of I guess, inadvertent uh, damage to root balls and the like um, doesn't happen. Yeah, be sweet, yes. Huh? Thank you. Yes, okay. please. Um, Ms. Papworth, could you please pull up the uh, tree uh, versus easement uh, graphic, please? Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, the the point is well taken, and we had that discussion, and uh, I think it was last fall. It was great uh, to have met and uh, entertained this uh, consideration. 
Uh, what should be, and I took some pictures, which I could probably pull up on my phone, but they may not come out too well. Um, the hedgerow, if we can start closer to the river, and this is not to dissuade anything, just by explanation, um, that the majority of these trees that you see are rooted in the drainage easement of uh, the neighbor as opposed to on Mr. McMullen's side. And I was looking here actually to see if I had a different uh, older shot. The, <clears throat> the trim hedge, as you can see, is basically out of harm's way in that regard. I should actually come back, I apologize. Yes, we would entertain uh, making certain that uh, circumstances are put in place with regards to, uh, to the trees. Um, in that regard, on this side, the spruces, there are three or four spruces on Mr. McMullen's side of the uh, line in the easement, which are about eight inch diameter. Uh, those ones um, will be affected, but otherwise everything you see essentially of the greenery um, is rooted uh, back at and beyond the lot line. So we have, the better part of 10 plus feet between the edge of construction and those uh, trees there, which I think are overgrown cedar or some variant of the sort. Um, in that sense, the green is basically an area you can walk virtually under all of that, which is in Mr. McMullen's part of the three meter easement. Um, there is very little actually rooted in that strip. Um, the crowns the highest point of the trees which are forward half uh, basically if you will uh, facing side to the building up to the road uh, the actual because the center of the trunk is within the easement uh, the highest point of all of those trees is back in within the easement so the crest line of those trees against the sky and thus the perception of it against the new building is such that that's not going to be affected. Um, as far as the wispy, um, I apologize, I'm looking at the picture sideways. <laughs> the, the trees essentially are, you know, shooting off limbs like that, looking for sun. And what has happened over time is that the tree has gone asymmetric with uh, longer boughs going towards Mr. McMullen's property. And we were looking to judiciously clip the end off of some of those boughs uh, as it would relate to enough for scaffolding and thing along the side of the house to do um, siding and such. Uh, but actually within his easement, there are no or virtually of any little sapling maybe or something in there. Uh, basically, it's just like pine straw down there. There's not much growing in there at all. So in summary, uh, Mr. McMullen is across the way and he'll speak up if need be uh, in contrary to what I'm going to say, but I don't think so. Um, to protect this from the point of view of a future construction, uh, this one by Carl or by other, um, that uh, sorry, phone ring. <laughs> that the, uh, the the primary trees starting initially within their property, of course, are not going to be touched, and that only just the outermost uh, limbings, uh, you know, to provide for construction purposes would be clipped. At which point, actually, when the house is in place, looking from the other side, one would not even be conscious of them not being there as it were the five mr. feet four feet and mr brown have are you have you uh hired an arborist to ensure that uh, all that is done i apologize uh, judiciously uh that is not being done because there are no distinctive trees on this site first of all for scale and these being just the wisps coming from trees rooted on the neighboring property and are having obliged we are obliged to a 10-foot setback uh, to the building construction site because of the easement uh, that initially at this phase, it was not really seen as something that would affect the trees themselves health-wise. And it was just a question of uh, cutting back some of the search for some growth 
of the asymmetric uh, bowels going to the north into the site. All right. So we would, uh, if, Carl, would you be amenable that putting that in there that for the purposes of construction and planning and approval of the construction hereafter as it were, that an arborist uh, yeah. could be counseled? Yes, is that fine? Okay, That's, thank you very much for that. Mr. White, I see that you had your hand up. Do you have a question? Yes, Madam Chair, I just noticed from the comments received from our forestry services department branch, uh, they've clearly identified that there's many distinctive trees on the site and they are recommending requirement for, well, they're requiring a tree disclosure report at the building permit stage. So there's going to have to be some, just some significant work done in terms of identifying and, uh, identifying distinctive trees and I would, I would suggest protecting them where that's necessary. Thank you, Mr. White, for raising that. I just noticed that myself. Um, so you're right. I think that um, that there will be a need. Now, Mr. Mr. Brown, just to, just let the committee yeah. chat about this for a minute. So, um, so uh, yeah, and I agree, possibly then at that point, uh, having to hire an arborist or something of the like would be helpful. So Ms. Ramirez, I know you had your hand up as well, so please. Um, through you, Madam Chair, in previous discussions with the applicant, we had um, discussed the tree conservation report and uh, we had, um, I anticipated um, after hearing from the neighbor that this would be something that they might want addressed. And so we crafted um, a condition um, and uh, Carl, or sorry, Don, I can go ahead and say it. Yeah. So um, the wording that we crafted was the owners acknowledge and agrees to include tree disclosure information on the grading plan submission or in a separate report prepared by an arborist identifying those trees that are protected under city tree bylaws. And similarly, the vegetation and trees along the southwest portion of the property to be assessed uh, with respect to the level of nature protection that may be required during construction to ensure the retention of the visible tree crest line as viewed from the southwest at distance towards the subject property. All right, so that it would be a new condition, is that correct, Ms. Ramirez? So the tree disclosure report, yes, it would be a uh, through humanitarian, yes, it would be a new condition. Um, the tree disclosure report. Uh, covers the trees that are protected under city bylaws. And so by adding that second paragraph, it addresses the neighbor's concern regarding the trees or the vegetation along that Southwest portion. And um, after speaking with Don, um, the, the, we, we worded the second paragraph uh, to be something that both he and Carl were comfortable with. All right, yeah. so help me out here, Mr. Ramirez, um, is that, uh, I'm looking at the conditions, your list of conditions on this application. And so I'm, I'm trying to ascertain that for the record, are we saying that we're actually adding a condition number, and I think by my estimation, it's a new condition number nine, or have you got something already in here that you're proposing that that second paragraph be added? Um, this would be a new condition. Addition. Uh, you could put it in with the, if the development, I believe you have a development agreement in there. So you could lump it in that we enter into a development agreement and this could be a condition of the development agreement. So that um, I don't know what, 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 how quickly they're going to move on construction, but this would be, this would give them some flexibility. So it doesn't have to be done within the year, but um, if you lump it in in development agreement. All right, normally, so you have under, sorry, Ms. Ramirez, under, under your condition number two, you talk about an infrastructure agreement. Is that what you're talking about there? Uh, yes, so there, there's the infrastructure agreement that we, we have. So you could put it in um, as a separate agreement there, or you could leave it on its own. Um, if you leave it on its own, then typically we wouldn't get this type of information until it was associated with a building permit. Um, so it depends on how quickly the applicant wants to move um, regarding this um, building on this lot. All right, so what I'm attempting to do here is to ensure that we have one, so just one requirement for a development agreement and everything that should be in the agreement listed with it. 
So if, uh, if I'm looking at number two and we're talking about an infrastructure agreement, so we would change the wording then, if I understand things correctly, to development agreement. <laughs> and then the somewhere in, uh, so, so <laughs> Mr. Mr. Brown, I may ask you to mute <laughs> at some point. Um, so then, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at the rest of this. So. Now in number three, you're talking about an agreement, another agreement for the noise. So I'm just trying to find the right place, Ms. Ramirez, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, now you talk about a development agreement again under number four for the geotechnical report. Is that the right place for um, yeah, it? Yeah, I would say that that would be the right place for it uh, because there are certain recommendations that come out of that geotechnical report. And so, um, and also to the uh, neighbor's point that um, the vegetation, they believe that it also supports slope stability. So I would say that, yes, if you could put it there, that that would be an appropriate place for it. All right, so Mr. Brown, I'm gonna ask you a quick question. So you've, you've, you're familiar with the wording that Ms. Ramirez read out and you're, and you're comfortable with adding it to uh, condition number, hang on, back to condition number four? That was postulated. Added paragraph? That postulated together and yes. Okay, great. So that's what we're gonna do for the record. So Ms. Ramirez, does uh, committee staff have that wording already? Um, not yet, I will send it over to Christine right away. All right, that would be great. Any members of the committee at this point want to speak to that? Are you okay with the addition of that? Any issues? So you're okay? Yes, we're good. We're good with adding that. Okay, good. All right. So and uh, and I take it then, Mr. Brown and Mr. McMillan, you're both happy with uh, with that as well. That's uh, that's an acceptable addition. Great, thank you. Okay, good. Well, I guess may, that. May I, may I have a question, if I may, or? Just yes, we can. Yes. With regards to the remark made about the forestry group, I believe that was made by looking at it from aerial photographs because it speaks to may have, I believe, as opposed to does have. The largest tree on the uh, site is 46 centimeters, um, and the other ones are in the range of eight inches, 200. So in that sense, uh, I believe the, the statement was not an absolute. There are, but it was there may be. So it was a, a, a warning or a request from forestry to reflect on the topic as opposed to it being an existing. And also Lucy and I had a, occurred, uh, a discussion about the servicing agreement. Um, it infers about paying for extending services, but on the road, but as I know it, we probably do not have to. Having it in there is fine because it's, it's addressed, but we do not believe we are gonna have to uh, extend any uh, sewer on the street. Then it'll be no problem to clear yeah. that condition. Exactly. Right? So, okay, so Mr. Wade, I saw that you have a hand yeah. up again. Madam, Madam Chair, just to clarify the, the information that we received in our package on this application clearly advises that forestry notes that this portion of land has numerous trees on site, uh, many distinctive trees on site, tree disclosure report required at building permit stage. They are very specific in saying that there are there are trees on site that they they want to see uh, accounted for all right thank you for that uh, that precision then mr mr white we know the condition is there so i don't think we need to go through any more discussion with that i'm going to go back to our speakers mr leaf and miss uh, clo hesse if is there anything else you'd like to add i'm going to give you another minute no, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that covers it uh, with uh, one caveat to make sure uh, we've um, got our point across uh, clearly. Uh, and I want to thank everybody, uh, including um, Mr. McMullen and uh, Don for that as well, and Lucy. Um, this is a hedge, so it doesn't count as a distinctive tree, but it is uh, very significant. Um, so that's why we wanted that included. We think that the wording does cover it, but to, to clarify, if we could add uh, to the vegetation plan, we could say, uh, and, and just make including the hedgerow, that would be perfect. If we could add to the wording, just insert the words, including the hedgerow between the properties. 
Sorry. Right, so Ms. Ramirez, any issues with that? Or do you think that the wording covers that, uh, the wording that you've proposed sufficiently covers that already? Um, I believe it sufficiently covers it. I'm amenable to including it. Um, I would uh, also ask uh, Carl and Don to kind of weigh in as well. So Mr. Brown, are you okay with adding, including the hedgerow? Um, if need be, the hedgerow is uh, specifically the lower half of the uh, treescape I think he's referring to. Are you talking about the, the trimmed hedge or are you talking about the whole row? Just I'm like talking about, uh, oh. sorry, uh, Don, I'm talking about both, uh, okay. but um, in, in particular, uh, so if I've used the wrong terminology, forgive me. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, in particular, what I'm worried about being damaged uh, is the part along the, the new wall of the house that would be uh, adjacent. Uh, and um, while I understand what you were saying about uh, the construction and the setback, uh, my observations of the branches are that they have kind of uh, grown over the easement over time and that that uh, an arborist kind of looking at whatever judicious trimming there is, uh, if they could uh, give a, an opinion as to how to do that without damaging the trees, that would be the ideal. Okay, so from that point of view, very well taken from the point of view of um, sap, how to cut them, how to maintain them, et cetera, is a very valid point. Uh, okay. I'm, okay, I'm okay with regards to the terminology, if it be in there or generalized as we had it. Yeah. All right, let's just add the words then, uh, including the hedgerow, from Ms. Ramirez, yeah, if you wouldn't them, mind. Them. I, you probably have already sent it over, but if you could just make that, make that quick change, that would be good. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much then uh, you very for much. your uh, for your your presence and for participating tonight. We we really appreciate the time people take. Anyone else out there? Before I close the public hearing portion, anyone else? Not seeing anybody else. So, I think uh, I think we're good. We're closing the, the public uh, portion down at this point. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, committee. So, um, uh, yes, Ms. Willis. Um, Madam Chair, just something is kind of um, rattling around in my head about the comment about the previous approval for the encroachment of the little T turnaround on the right of way and the mention that Ms. Ramirez made that this will require a new approval. My only, I'm not sure who I'm asking, but um, if we tie approval, assuming that we approve this to the plans, and the encroachment permit is not granted for whatever reason, does that negate all of the variances because we're no longer adhering to the plan? So, no, Mr. Brown, I'm, I'm, at this point, I'm just looking for staff to, to provide comments to us on, on things like that. So Ms. Ramirez, do you know that offhand? I, I guess, I guess um, and I'm not even sure if Ms. Ms. Ramirez is the right person no. to ask, because I understand what you're saying. If we tie it to the plans and then there's a problem with the encro encroachment permit, does it mean that it actually has to come back? So um, we sometimes use wording that uh, gives us some wiggle room, which would be to say, we tie it to the plans, save and accept for the portion that lies outside of the property boundary. Uh, if in that case, there's an issue then it doesn't affect anything that's been approved within the property boundary itself. Does that work? That sounds good. For you, Madam Chair, that sounds good to me. All right, anyone else from the committee want to speak to that? To, are you okay with that approach? I mean, other, to say, other than to say that if we approve that then the, and the T doesn't get approved, in theory, they still have to have a little bit of concrete on the, on the front of the property, but that seems pretty minor in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So, um, Ms. Uh, Brenning, is it possible to simply do that, um, tie it to the plan, save and accept for the portion affecting the fence line on, or I guess the driveway, I guess, um, outside the property boundary? Madam Chair, we could tie the approval uh, to the plans as they relate to the variance sought, as they relate to the variances sought, and they are specifically no. on the applicant's property. All right, that makes some sense. That works for me as well. Ms. Willis, Mr. Handel? Yeah. 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 All right. Okay, good. I think that's what we'll do then. I think that's the approach we'll take. Um, 
Anything else before we vote here? On this application, no? All right, so committee on the consent and on the minor variance, what say you, we in, in approval? Let's see, all right, okay. So it looks like both applications are granted and uh, that would be unanimous for uh, staff so that they know um, to support both um, both the consent and the minor variance application. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for uh, joining us for your your fulsome presentation. It was very helpful. It's good to uh, it's good to to get that kind of detail, especially for a site where it's this complicated. So um, so thank you for taking the time, and uh, good luck with uh, with the development of the house. It's going to look great. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, if I could just make one last point. Uh, I believe staff wanted an amendment or something added to variance D. Yes. To, in to include the building as well and not just the balconies. Oh, okay. You're talking about something else. I thought you were talking. Okay. Let me have a look. Sorry. Just uh, I know staff had a comment um, with regards to variance D and the setback. I just believe right. we should read that into the record before we close. Ramirez, can you come back to us, please, and tell us what it is that I, I must have missed here on this? Um, through you, Madam Chair, the um, the act, maximum extent was taken from the balconies, but what this will do, um, it also works if you tie to plans, but the um, this will make sure that the building doesn't encroach further than 15.7 meters to uh, the high water mark, whereas before it talked about the um, the balconies to, in relation to the high water mark. Okay, so we've got fifteen point five seven meters in relation to the uh, to the point, setback of the dwelling, and then the cantilever decks is fourteen point six, right? Okay, so uh, what do we what do we need to change? Uh, just to add that uh, the wording after um, the first little bit where they permit a reduced setback of 14.6 uh, meters to the high water line of the Rideau River and to permit the reduced setback of 15.7 for the dwelling to the high water line of the Rideau River. So Ms. Uh, Brennan, have you got what you need there? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. All right, good, good. I'm glad you were on that because I missed that one completely. Thank you. Okay, I think we're, uh, I think we're done with this application. All right, thank you, thank you everyone for that. So I guess that brings us pretty much to the end of our um, of our agenda for this evening. I don't see anything uh, anything else. Before we sign off, I guess I, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn for one. Is there a motion to adjourn, yes, Ms. Margovich. And do I have a seconding of that um, of that motion, Mr. Hindle? Thank you. Now, before we go away, can I ask um, Ms. Ramirez, Mr. Hodgins, Ms. Papworth, um, and Ms. Brennan to stay back just for a quick minute. I just have one thing, I, 